promote them. Okay. Um, I am going to read our little declaration so that we can get started officially. Um, the time is now 7 of 3, and seen as a quorum of committee members is in attendance, this public hearing is being called to order. Welcome everybody to the November 28th, um, 2023 pub, uh, public meeting, not hearing, um, of the Amherst Community Development Block Grant Advisory Committee. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by the state legislature on July 16, 2022, and probably extended again since then, but I don't have the date, this meeting is being conducted virtually using the Zoom platform. The meeting is being recorded and minutes are being taken as usual. And we'll just do a, um, a quick roll call um, so we have it on camera that we're all here. I'm Becky Michaels, the chair of the CDBG Advisory Committee. And I'll go just in order. Zoe, you're next. Um, I'm Zoe Sulis. I'm a member of the committee. And Suzanne. Suzanne Schilling, committee member. And Nat. And Nat Larson. Great. And Nate. Hi, Nate Malloy, a planner with the town. Um, so we have um, an agenda tonight um, that has a lot of things on it, but that we can probably move through, through fairly quickly and we will have time for um, public comments toward the end. Um, and if people raise their hands as when we reach that section, uh, we will call on you and, and bring you into the meeting if there's anybody here right now hearing this. Um, so we can go ahead and get started. Just going up the agenda. Um, so I guess first is announcements. If anybody has any announcements, yeah, I'll jump in. The um, the state increased the mini entitlement uh, grant up to nine twenty five instead of eight hundred twenty five thousand. Great. So what does that look like division wise? Oh, I don't know. I didn't do any of the math. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I almost don't want to believe it because um, it just came came out of the blue last week. And um, I don't know, it just seems, you know, I, I know um, the competitive communities could apply for a higher amount. So my guess is that some many entitlement communities must have um, complained or made note of that. And so they increased the mini award, but um, I was almost, I was almost gonna, I was expecting another notice to say that they were gonna take that back. <laughs> and that would be divided percentage wise between non-social service and social service? The percentages would be the same. So 20% social service that would go up by a bit. Yeah, I mean, it's just that usually their pots, um, you know, what the state gets is limited. And so if there's 11 communities, it's, a you know, over a million dollars now, which if they have 24 million a year, it's actually a million dollars is a pretty big percentage to go to minis. Um, but. Um, well, great, that's a nice announcement. Well, we'll have, we'll have no problem allocating it, I'm sure. Exactly, right. exactly. Um, great. Anybody else have any announcements they want to make? Okay, great. So we'll move on to um, a discussion of the 2022-23 grant startups, um, specifically around site visits. Um, so Nate, I'll let you lead in and then I do have a comment about site visits. Yeah, uh, you know, the social services are getting under contract. They started as of November 1st. Valley CDC is doing a micro enterprise uh, technical assistance program which started December 1st or will start. Uh, and, you know, I usually schedule site visits. I haven't yet. So I was going to say that we, if a committee member wanted to come, they could. Um, it'll probably be virtually. Uh, some might be in person, but um, we typically try to have site visits at the beginning, middle, and end of social services and other activities. And so that's just something that will be should be happening in the next month or so. The one question I had when I was thinking about site visits was, um, and it probably something that we'll discuss going forward, but if everybody recalls what we have now is the opportunity to be giving grants out to organizations that may have already received grants in that 22, 23 cycle. And I, I don't know that it would be a conflict necessarily to do a site visit with a place that's already gotten money, but to sort of spend more time with that organization and, and learn the ins and outs of what they're doing. And I was thinking more sort of being on site and um, whether that would be something that we should wait to do until after we've done the allocation process this time around. I think if it's virtual, it's maybe less so, um, but it was just something that I don't know if other people have feelings about that. 
Well, and this cycle is pretty short, so that timing probably could work since by the time we get through the applications and the holidays, I mean, we probably wouldn't, unless it is virtual, that's easier to schedule, but it probably makes sense that it, that could work out. Um, and I agree that probably makes sense to not maybe visit someone that's in the middle of the application period, unless it was something vital to the application that we wanted to observe in person that a site visit could be beneficial to. Just in terms of the overall schedule too, we got lots going on in you know, December and January and February, um, yeah. you know, maybe sometime in the spring. Yeah, yeah we could do that. I, I mean, yeah, typically I, yeah, my startup visit should be sooner than later, um, but. So maybe Nate, you should schedule it on your, you know, do what you, would normally do and we'll yep. just hold off um and you know maybe do site visits that are more in person and actually seeing programs at work sure. um later on in the spring after we finish this round all right okay great um anything else on that in that area no no i mean i think the um you know, it's a two or one and a half year grant. So the activities that are starting now can run through 2025. I think we have them ending in the summer of 25, but it is a longer um, performance period. So uh, the capital projects we have won't be started until next summer, probably. Right. Hopefully yeah. the next summer. So plenty of time. Yeah, I don't know the town. We, you know, we have, like a few years ago, we were really successful applying for grants. And then we have, you know, the block grant now, but we have two MassWorks grants and some other infrastructure grants. And it's all, it's really great to get it all. And then all of a sudden you realize, well, wow, we have six big projects we're supposed to be doing at the same time. And yeah. Um, all right, so why don't we move then to the 2024 application process, which um, at our last meeting, um, we sort of talked a little bit about, and um, it's Zoe's first time, Suzanne's second time. Um, and what we want to do tonight is finalize as much as possible what the RFP will look like. Um, and, um, you know, we set the dates last time, so we, we have that set, but to look really at the, at the actual RFPs and, um, the community development strategy that you had sent out, Nate, which is the 2022, is that, I just couldn't remember if that was something that we create or that's something that the town does that is given to us. Can you just remind yeah, me? Yeah, I mean, it's a from? staff, you know, staff developed it, but really it's it should be influenced by, you know, we're going to have the public hearing on December 12th and then any, you know, any priorities that the committee comes up with or what we think might want to be changed in it. Uh, so, um, I mean, it's really limited to three pages, needs to summarize, you know, both block grant eligible projects and kind of what the community, um, you know, is invested in, and then what are projects or activities that would be undertaken. And so, yeah, I mean, the way the, the strategy is structured now is it mimics the chapters of the master plan, so like housing um you know historic cultural resources and then we have a sustainability piece at the end and then um a few action items and so you know typically in that we have to identify the activities that we will then fund and so it's kind of a, a funny thing but um you know for instance we have kind of generic i was just going to open the document we have generic things in the action plan like um support social service programs and we mention a bunch of them and we do that just so then, you know, and, and it may, I mean, it's not like we're trying to be too broad, but really those are, um, you know, what we identified as priority. So I think that the strategy could be updated after the hearing to, you know, if we, if we are, hear things that maybe we change. Um, but, you know, I don't expect that it'll change much year to year. It's kind of a. It's still it's still a pretty current to me. The only um, thing I saw in there that we might want to take out is under the transportation. It references the Valley Bike Share Program. I think that's at this point kind of defunct or in hiatus. Mm. Yeah, I mean, uh... yes. oh, I like that. But this was fairly recent, so it's not like we're coming back to it three years later. So. 
Looks I know. Like yeah, I'll, I'll do a quick uh, closer read on it. I know if there's anything that really jumps out like that, I'll ask Stephanie about the bike share. I thought we were trying to find another vendor, but it might be that it's not. Yeah, it might actually be kind of dormant for now. And then, um, you know, and then we mentioned the target areas and then we have our priority projects and we have, you know, eight of them. And so, I mean, really what it would be too, is we have a public hearing in December, we can update the RFPs and this document if we think there's some priority for social service or something that we missed. And then we hold a second public hearing to review the recommended activities in February. And at that public hearing, we also will also include updating the strategy too. And so if we need to do a last minute effort and say, oh, well, you know, maybe we have to tweak a, um, a target area, we could do that as well. So, I mean, I, you know, if you want to look at it individually or we talk about it more tonight, but I don't, I agree it was written just, um, I mean, not even a year ago, right? I think it was finalized less than a year ago, so. And prior to that, when had it been written? Is it something that does get updated pretty much every year or is? Yeah, we, I think, you know, so originally it was um, a number of years ago, you could, it could be six to eight pages. And before that I think was longer. And so we had an updated one in a few years, I think for in the 2000 teens, it kind of stayed the same for a number of years. And then um, probably for the 2020 grant or 21 grant, they reduced the pages or, and that's when it really um, we kind of updated it more thoroughly. So the document itself has been around, but I think probably this version is, um, I know Ben and I, more Ben worked on it and really tried to update every category. So, I mean, we mentioned like 2023 funds and other things. So I, I feel like, um, it captures quite a bit of what more recent things the town's been doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, it's really, I, yeah, I, I just kind of laugh. I kind of laugh because the state's like, oh, you should update this every year. And oftentimes communities say, well, you know, we have a master plan that's good for 10 years. I mean, this is supposed to be like a mini master plan. Are we really going to change it drastically year to year? Right. And I think maybe some of the accomplishments can be updated, but in terms of the goals, like, you know, did our housing goals change or our transportation goals? I'm, um, typically they don't. Or the activities to be updated, you know, but pretty much right. the priorities remain the same if I'm understanding. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, right. So if, for instance, there's a proposal that comes in and it's like, wow, okay, wow, we hadn't really thought about this or it's a, something in North Amherst and we really want to make North Amherst a target area. I think we could justify it. You know, there's the new library expansion, there's work going on around WD Coles, there's, the mill district. Uh, yeah. And so then, you know, we could say, okay, well, wow, we had um, a few proposals for North Amherst and let's make North Amherst a target area and we update the strategy accordingly. Um, so the December public hearing is one of the bullets. Is that just to note that that's sort of where we will hear back from the community? Yeah, and I haven't updated the webpage, but I think um, we talked about, you know, trying to advertise that and you know committee members are can also let people know yep. um, i'll get a public hearing notice going tomorrow i'll email it around by the end of the week to different organizations and get it online and um i think we also talked about you were going to email it out to the um to the schools to the superintendent's office maybe to put it into the mm -hmm. their weekly update yeah. and let families know yeah um, and the COSA newsletter. And then also, I think we were going to send it to the grant recip recipients and actually, I guess, anybody who's applied if they have newsletters to send it out to their constituents as well. Yes, yep. Great. Um, so the RFP um, and the review criteria, um, knowing that we will hear from people and organizations um, at the December public hearing, I think we can have kind of an initial conversation right now about um, what the RFP looks like. Did everybody have a chance to take a look at it? Um, again, sort of similar to the community development strategy, we actually rewrote quite a bit of this last year, I believe, and, and sort of tried to update it by adding in equity, adding in environmental um, issues as, as part of what we were looking for um, from 
the um, in the responses that we would get. Um, so I didn't see from from my point of view, other than you know dates and names changing, um, because now you get to receive them again, Nate, not Ben. Um, <laughs> the uh, there wasn't a ton to me that looked like it needed changing. Um, mm -hmm. The one, the one thing that keeps popping up in my mind, and I don't know whether now is the time to talk about it. Maybe an initial conversation now, and then it'll be interesting to hear from people at the public hearing, is whether we want to make a decision about restricting who we would give grants to um, by by sort of at the for at the outset saying we're not going to duplicate 2020 the two-year grant with with this one-year grant. And so if somebody has received it, received that two-year um, grant, then and then they would get another year um, of money that would be overlapping with the same year. So essentially, you know, two, two um, allocations going to the same organization in the same year um, and whether we would want to make a decision. I'm not advocating one way or the other, but I think that's something that we could potentially decide and if we were going to decide that, I think it's the the kind thing to do is to decide it up front so that we're not asking people to work on applications um, and to you know put all that work into something that in the end we would say, actually, I think we're not going to you know do duplicate um, allocations. So I don't know if people have thoughts on that. I do agree, you know, that we need to do this, you know, ahead of time. You know, if we if we if we are going to be setting criteria like that. Um, uh, however, you know, is the idea here that we will be funding um, basically, you know, totally different activities that fall within, you know, the, um, you know, the priorities or, you know, um, if we are to be funding the same ones, you know, as long as they have a different, you know, uh, component, you know, to the program. I think we've talked about it before, so I can go either way, but I do agree that this needs to be, you know, um, laid out before. I think if we had fully funded the projects that were requested, um, that would be a different story, but I, I know that we didn't fully fund um, the, the request that we had, so I would um, you know, some of the needs are very great for some of the applications that we received. So I'd hate to cut something off if if it was going to really fill a need among the priorities. Um, so yeah, yeah, the state wrote and said, um, you know, I asked what we should do in terms of overlapping activities, and they recommended. We have we have our social service um, contracts start November one and end June thirtieth, twenty twenty five, and they said, oh, just have the next year's grant start on July first, twenty twenty five, and just say it's a continuation of the activity. That way, you could fund it, um, mm -hmm. which which would be fine. I think the um, what it does is it pushes back the start date. So, you know, the state would say that if we apply this spring, they're gonna to try to get contracts going in the fall. And so instead of starting it December one, like we normally would, they would start July one for some. Um, I don't think that's a problem. It's just, you know, it- But does it just, that just sort of push off the problem? I mean, if then the next round of funding, we have the same issue and that we're sort of putting everything ahead six months basically just to keep funding the same i think the next year we'd run the contracts july 1 through june 30th 2026 and then um or we could do shorter and i, I think it would probably resolve itself but it might right it might push the problem off a little you know yeah i mean it's a pretty big decision i don't know um you know how you you know if you would say you wouldn't fund you know, any of the five organizations that they apply. Yeah, I guess my, my concern would be that, um, um, you know, we've, we tend to have funded the strongest applicants. So if we kind of take them off the table, then we're left with, judging by the typical, you know, prior years, a couple stronger applicants that we weren't able to fund, and then maybe a number of weaker applicants. Um, so, I guess I would hesitate to make that a hard and fast rule up front rather than waiting to see what comes in. Mm -hmm. 
that's sort of where I'm I fall as well. Um because I think we just we don't know what's going to come in. And I think even though um the sort of general um priorities stay the same, the general you know development strategy stays the same. I think there are increases that we hear about in need in certain areas that are you know perhaps greater than in others. Um, and I think cutting ourselves off from funding those um I don't think it's necessary to do it. I just wanted to have a, and I, I think um, I think we, we just needed to have the conversation and make sure that we made that decision. So, yeah, and, I, and I think some of these organizations are large enough that um, they're doing a, a number of tasks that we may have funded A, but they're going to apply for B or C. Um, so I, I, I would err on the side of, um, not cutting off any of those prior funded organizations. Okay, good. It looks like we all agree on that and um, and then we can have made that decision intentionally and we can read more. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Only 10 to 15 pages. That's right. We do we do we do limit the uh, the, the page number. Yes, so. exactly. <laughs> And to be clear, that was clearly not the reason I was raising this. <laughs> um, so um, the types of activities, um, we had rewritten these and I think added some in last year. Um, does anybody have any thoughts on that's um, number five on the on page four of the I'm looking at the social service application. Um, and so that's sort of the the um, the list that that um, the programs need to fall within. And I don't know if anybody has any thoughts about adding anything there or any that wouldn't we wouldn't need to have anymore. My recollection is that when we did this last time, we didn't actually remove anything. I think we sort of um, tightened the language or broadened the language where necessary to to. Um, meet more what we were really trying to do with the with the grants, um, but that they generally have been essentially the same, I think, for probably decades. Right. I mean, if there was anything else that can always fall under other, but I think we're, we're capturing uh, what the needs really are still. Um, so th that was really the only area that I thought we needed to have conversation around for the social service activity application. Um, does anybody have any other areas they want to raise in that particular application? No, I thought we did a pretty good job last time okay. updating yeah. it, and it wasn't that long ago. So <laughs> Exactly. <yeah. laughs> um, Nate, it, anything you want to bring it, up on that? <laughs> no, I mean, I think we'll... Um... I think we have to update, like you said, some of the um, some of the some of the information. You know, I think the uh, page limit and how we try to word that is important. And we, you know, I know we've added bold and certain things to really make sure people follow it and underline things. Um, and my recollection is that people really did. I, is that? I mean, I don't. Yeah, think I, yeah, and I think I think having the, um, you know, the fifteen pages and then the five. For attachments is really helpful yep. and i think it's i think it's important uh for two reasons one is um you know it's less for you know really how can you succinctly submit a proposal in 20 pages less for us to read and then we in the town when we submit our applications to the state they limit our page numbers too so we can't you know we can't submit a 40 page proposal for one activity you know they want to see you know the three page narrative they want to see a budget page or two and a few things so even you know um, so what, what we incorporate into the request for a proposal really translates into what the state would want to see, even in terms of some of the review criteria. So we're trying, you know, we mirror that pretty closely. So what the organization provides to you and then how you recommend them is also then what the state looks at. So, uh, you know, I think we get, and that way we, you know, our proposals are ready to be submitted, um, as opposed to having someone write more information, you know, after they're recommended or something, we really, I feel like we've created a pretty good process. Great. So, yeah, I didn't, I haven't, you know, 
I don't think they've, uh, yeah, I don't think the state's changed anything. So um, I should, I, I, I'll make a note to just look at their, their proposed changes were really minimal. So I, I think all this would probably holds true. And do you, um, so you'll go in and make the basic changes of dates and, and all of that, and then mm -hmm. um, I was going to say I would offer to do it, but you know those addresses and dates. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. And then, yeah, we can have the maximum amount. I think, you know, what we talked about at the last meeting is um, typically we can recommend up to five social services. It doesn't have to be five. And then, you know, we build the budget up to 20% of the grant award. So, you know, there's always a discussion about, okay, do we fund five? Is it three? And we never have a strict rule of award there. And so, you know, some communities will really say that they have one or two priorities and then they, that's really all they fund is if, you know, and we don't do that in Amherst and that's fine. Um, so, but I, some of it would be, you know, when it's when it is the proposal review time, we can just remember that it doesn't have to be five or it could be five. And, you know, sometimes it's difficult when you have to parse the budgets. But yeah. Um, but I agree. I don't think we need to decide any of that now. We'll wait to get see what we get. Right. Um, for the non social service activity application, I didn't have any recommendations to make or changes. And again, we redid this one and it's more um there's yeah. from date <laughs> yeah we just need to get proposals i know staff's meeting next week to talk about it and i think i know one or two agencies might submit but um, i was surprised last year there weren't that many yeah all right great um so I think that covers topic number three. Yeah, I mean, we, I mean, we did, I sent, I did send what um, the previous funding allocations were the different agencies as an attachment. I'm pretty sure I sent that around, right, for everyone. Um, you may have, I also just noted it myself. Um, and so that I'll put, I can put that online, but that is something we can use when we review uh, proposals. Yeah, I think we'll absolutely want that sort of handy. Yeah. Great. Um, all right. Does anybody have any other questions or comments or topics under the 2024 application process? Because if not, then we'll move into um, public comment. Is there anybody here for public uh, comment? Lev is here. Okay. Lev, if you want to raise your hand. Sure, you can unmute yourself. Uh, thank you so much. I do not have a public comment. I was just listening in to better understand the RFP process. And as always, just really appreciate the committee's uh, deliberation and thoughtfulness. So thank you so much. Thank you. I hope Giving Tuesday is going well for you. Watching it anxiously, that's for sure. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Um, all right. Any oh, items? Uh, Lev, your, did your hand raise again? or? No, my apologies. I was trying to lower my hand. Three years in, you think we'd all we'd all be experts at this. No, I'm all set. Uh, have a lovely evening. Thank you, guys. You're just giving, you're just giving us high fives. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, so Nate, seeing um, Lev's still screen photo does remind me, can we, in the public hearing, do what we did toward the end last year and have people come in and actually be able to see them? Yes, yeah, yeah we can that do that. Great. Okay, great. Yeah, the yeah, that's usually what we do. Is sometimes it's just it takes a little bit more, you know, like it, it's a delay to bring people in, but it's really not that hard. Yeah. Um, and in terms of um, people speaking, just to sort of look at the the public hearing for just a minute, out of order, I guess. Um, we have in the past limited people to about three minutes, um, which I I think seems like a a good amount of time and enough for them to get to say what they want to say. 
Does anybody have any thoughts about changing that to either fewer minutes or more minutes? I think that's pretty consistent with the other committees in town and yeah. it seemed appropriate. I don't think we were cutting anybody off. Right. Yeah, no, it certainly wasn't like a hard, fast. No. Muting. Yeah, I know the, the planning board and town council, they put the little countdown clock on the screen. <laughs> I and think then kinder and gentler than that. We don't need to do that. And then and then at 10 seconds, it like beeps for the next 10 seconds to remind you <laughs> that you're supposed to end soon. So um yeah, no, I think three minutes is good. You know, I um we can all we'll put on our notice that we, you know, we we always say it anyways, that people can always provide comments through phone or email or any, you know, other correspondence. So um and if we yeah. do receive that, do we need to incorporated into the meeting by I'm thinking about school committee right where they read everything out loud so it's part of the yeah sometimes I'll read it or I, I'll post it in the packet or I'll send it to you so you all have it so that I mean that's as long as it's distributed to the committee um and then you know I think in the past I would have summarized if there was written comments but... okay great um I think we have reached the end of our agenda it's almost too quick, though. I think I we have know. to. No, do you want to chit chat for a little longer? <laughs> <laughs> are, no, we, are we, getting, think, are we yeah. getting paid by the hour? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> by the sheet of drywall, I'll just make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I, um, I was going to share the screen just quickly, though. I just wanted to. Um, um, hmm, I don't see. Yeah, maybe it's here. The um, so here is the list of what had been funded, and you know we don't. We don't, um, you know, we don't have any rule about not, you know, being funded in consecutive years or anything, but that sometimes that's discussed. And so I think this was sent around as an email. And so you can just see, you know, I went back a, a few years, but oh, I yeah, think that would be great if you could send that out. I thought I, I thought I did. Maybe, maybe you did. I apologize. If you... Yeah, I don't think I saw it. Okay. Um, yeah, not in that format. I don't right. think I saw that. And so, okay. Um, yeah, I'll, and I think, you know, like Nat said, usually we fund, you know, we rank the proposals first, then look at the a funding amount. But, you know, there is a pattern of who gets funded. And I don't, you know, sometimes people comment on that. And I think, you know, the response rate is that it's a comparative review year to year or application process to application process. And so, um, you know, sometimes we have, you know, different organizations apply and sometimes it's, you know, we get the same eight or nine or seven or whatever. Um, I think the, the, um the non-social service activities is something that gets to be more difficult as as we keep doing projects you know the target areas are what we see outlined here and the eligible block groups are in green and so there's really not a large area in town that is considered a majority lower moderate income households and to me that becomes the trickier equation is what you know what was what can what can be funded in these areas so. mm -hmm. You know, for instance, we could fund affordable housing in North Amherst because it's uh, directly related to uh, the tenants will be affordable. So that could work. But, you know, if it was a road project up here where it's not income eligible, then it's really hard to justify it unless we did income surveys for a particular street or something. Uh, right. And I actually, I remember somebody coming on and asking about sidewalks on Bay Road, I think. And yeah. The same issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've done income surveys before. They're difficult. You have to have a really high response rate. I think it's like 95% of the households have to respond. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that's um, something we to consider. You know, you can let anyone know that this is hap the application process is happening. And you know, in the review criteria, so I think what we had mentioned before, this is just from the other year, you know, individually you'd rank every category and then come up with your, you could come up with a composite score for each proposal. And then you, what you would send me is, all right, here's my order, you know, one, two, three. And for social services, it'd be similar. You know, I don't need to see your individual scores or this table. If for instance, family outreach was your first one and this was your second one, you would just send me that order. And then that's what I would, um, I would show the committee as we review proposals and say, okay, yeah, it looks like, you know, three of you rank this one in your top two. And, and that way that just is a beginning of the conversation. Okay. And so during the proposal review, 
um, you know, it is a public meeting. So the committee does, you know, has to discuss its, um, you know, all of that in a public setting. So, um, you know, most, I think the last few years, it's actually been done really, it's been really good discussions. And I think having this review matrix helps. And then we, you know, it, um, I think everyone takes it pretty seriously. So it, it goes pretty well. In years past, it wasn't as uh, formal. Some people would be like, oh yeah, I know that organization. It's like, oh goodness, come on. You're supposed to be doing this a little more judiciously. Yeah, no, I found that rubric to be really helpful. Yeah. Very. Very. All right, Nate, you were able to ex extend the meeting for an additional four minutes there. Is there anything else you want to say? No, but while we were talking, oh yeah. So you said you had it. Um, yeah, you guys said you hadn't received that email. So let me, I'll just send that. Um, I thought I had sent it to the group. The other, the other, oh no, maybe I didn't. I might've just printed these out from the website. I can't remember. But I'll, I'll send that out with all the attachments. I think it was an email with a lot of attachments. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, I'll send it out again. Thank you. And at least the four of you here could make December 12th. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, no, I haven't heard that people can otherwise. I just if we don't have a quorum, it would be a problem. It'd be a problem. Yeah. Hopefully Rika and Greg will join and right. we'll group together. All right, great. Great. All right, everyone. Well, thank you very much for your preparation and your thoughts today. And we will look forward to hearing from the public on December 12th. That one probably will be a longer meeting. Um, if the past or tells anything, um, but always really interesting and, and exciting to hear about the work that's being done. Um, and so until then. Okay, so I just one quick note. So usually the 12th, what we do is we have a public hearing to uh, receive public comment. And then that same evening we follow it immediately in you know, the same Zoom meeting or the same meeting with a public meeting to discuss any changes we'd wanna to make to the request for proposals. So if for instance, you know, a priority really seems to have, um, you know, bubble to the surface or if we want to change some wording or something. And so usually we have the public, you know, it's a, a two session to the meet to the evening. Um, it doesn't have to be more than two hours necessarily, but it, you know, depending on how much comment we receive or discussion there is. Yeah. Great. All right. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank, you. Thank you. All right. Have a good night. Bye. Thank you.